you haven't read any of those books, you're a liar. You don't read none of them books. Oh, you don't read them books. Oh. Today we're going to talk about St. Athanasius' famous apologetic work that is kind of forgotten. Now, if you're in the Orthodox circles, you may have heard of the work. And I said that we would actually do a, a response to paganism and the ideas of paganism. And this is, will be similar to the talk that I did on Gnosticism. So uh, if you want a corollary talk, go watch that one because it's going to deal with some of the same themes and arguments. There's a, a very close parallel at times between Gnosticism and paganism. But we're going to get also a treatment of orthodox apologetics and the unique approach to apologetics that orthodoxy has precisely because it's a revealed anthropology. I covered that in my talk on Logos and Logoi, if you watch that in regard to St. John Damascus's works and St. Maximus the Confessor's works. But when St. Athanasius was a young man, about 21 or 22, he wrote a famous apologetic treatise against the heathen or ad gentes. And this work is, is excellent. It's not long. It's very brief, probably about 20 or 30 pages. And it's followed usually, like in my set, it's followed by On the Incarnation of the Word, which is probably one of the more famous Athanasius uh, theological treatises, which deals with uh, you know the Logos becoming incarnate. But what we want to do in this talk is go through this famous work because it demonstrates a presuppositional orthodox apologetic and that's actually going to set it off against the Thomistic approach to apologetics which is classical arguments classical foundationalism as it's eventually known it become termed now why is it called classical uh, foundationalism and, and classical apologetics well because it's based on a certain medieval and ultimately to make things simple Thomistic anthropology we don't have that anthropology. Uh, we have a different anthropology. And so concepts like the noose uh, and the tripartite nature of man, that a man is actually has three faculties, right? Body, soul, and noose, and not just body slash intellect and soul, uh, which becomes the norm in the West. So a, a, a triadic view of man as opposed to a dyadic view of man is another one of the distinctive features of orthodox theology that sets it off against western latin roman catholicism now that's a little bit off topic and into theology but it's relevant because we're going to see that saint athanasius's approach to apologetics is much more in line with what I'm going to argue for and what you see me arguing with in the debates that I do and in the theological and philosophical talks that I do, which is the transcendental argument or presuppositional apologetics. And as we see, what this approach is going to do is it's actually going to deconstruct and through, um, through what we might call uh, what what in logic is called the reductio ad absurdum it reduces the opposing uh, oppos opposing position to absurdity based on internal contradictions now it does that because it doesn't hold ultimately to a classical foundationalist view of epistemology now those are kind of maybe big terms but basically what we're talking about here is do we have our knowledge base through stacking things on like a like a building a pyramid like of uh, foundational maxims and beliefs that are just self-evident and then we tack things on top of that like uh, common sense experience or things like this that is uh, typically what you will find in a Thomistic view right uh, you, you you have man as roughly speaking a kind of uh, blank slate uh, Thomas does uphold that roughly Aristotelian view of man as a blank slate, uh, and that most of what he knows and experiences occurs through uh, empiricism. And so Aquinas becomes the progenitor of the empirical tradition and philosophy. Now, in, in Orthodox theology, it's a little bit different because sometimes you will have Orthodox theologians who speak of empirical uh, theology, right? that our, our theology is experiential absolutely that's definitely true so we, we are not we don't want to deny 
the role of the body right, in this process. As St. Gregory Palamas says that the direct vision of God uh, actually at times will uh, you know, involve the body itself. Uh, so it's not strictly speaking some sort of a mystical vision, although it could be. Uh, St. Gregory Palamas speaks of it in both ways. So the, the direct seeing of God, as we come to learn, uh, is based on the revelation of the Theophanies. And this is important because I stress this many times that uh, when I was a Roman Catholic, when I was reading Augustine, um, I was actually surprised by the fact that he seemed to have a hard time in On the Trinity dealing with the Theophanies of the Old Testament when they manifest. Is this actually the Logos or is this an angel? Now, you say, well, what does that really matter? Well, when he debates this with himself, at one point he says, well, it can't be the pre-incarnate Logos because God is absolutely simple and it makes no sense for an absolutely simple essence to appear within time and space. And so that would require the entire Trinity manifesting within time and space, and that's not possible. So Augustine has a problem with this idea of a historical time and space manifestation of the pre-incarnate logos. And he makes that very clear numerous times in the first three or four books of On the Trinity. Now, I didn't understand back when I was Roman Catholic why that was really that big of a deal, but as I learned Orthodox theology, it became apparent why that's such a big deal. When we come to the New Testament, when Jesus is transfigured, the apostles see the divine light, right? This is Matthew 17, the transfiguration. Now, is that divine light that they see something created? Or is it something divine? Is it an uncreated energy or light of God? Now, Roman Catholicism has, on the whole, pretty much, as far as I'm aware, universally said this is a created light. And that's because, in their view of divine simplicity, it's really not possible that you could have the divine itself manifesting in time and space. So there has to be, various theses have been concocted over the history of Roman Catholicism to try to explain this. Uh, or it's just all society is not really mattering. Who cares? Now, some of the theories that have tried to replace this or bridge this gap is created grace. The idea, well, there's a, some kind of bridge uh, of, of a created substance, right? Uh, uh, Augustine speaks of infused righteousness. The Council of Trent speaks of infused righteousness, so forth and so on, as if that bridges the gap uh, between God and the world and time and space, right? God and world. Uh, and, but what we get is still no clear uh, example or explanation, and that's because more than once in Denzinger, absolute divine simplicity has been defined as dogma. So in other words, in the Roman Catholic tradition, you're already bound by a doctrine of what simplicity means that precludes the possibility of there actually being the uncreated manifesting in time and space and history. Now you said, well, again, why is this such a big deal? Well, for the Orthodox, uh, and because we believe the New Testament teaches a real theosis, um, there's a problem. The problem with saying that the created grace or the infused righteousness or the infused love, as Trent, Trent says, the problem with saying that it's created is that there's no creature that can save us. In other words, another creation on top of creation, right? The incarnation is what's supposed to save us, right? Well, how does it save us? Well, uh, you know, it, it does this, it does that. Uh, you know, it, it, it's not clear exactly how this saves us precisely because of the transmission of created grace. And in fact, in the Summa, there's even discussions of what kind of grace the Logos transmits to the human nature in the incarnation. Now, in Orthodox theology, this is all laid out. It's all made very clear in the Sixth Council and in the writings of St. Maximus the Confessor against the Monothelites. And the Monothelites were confused by this as well because they made will a property of person. And when you make will a property of person, you, you, you think they thought they were going to solve problems in Christology by saying Christ had one will. But they didn't understand that what that also did was mean that God had three wills. And that's back to polytheism. And we're going to see why that matters here in a moment when we get to St. Athanasius' is apologetic. But I'm setting this up as to show that your apologetic method is not going to be different from your ecclesiology. And those two are not going to be different from your sacramentology. Those three are not going to be different from the way that you view the church and the incarnation and thus your Christology and your triadology. 
And by extension, one's view of scripture and inspiration is also modeled after all all of these same principles. So it's kind of, it is, in a way, you could look at it as systematic theology. There's nothing inherently wrong with talking about a systematic theology of orthodoxy. That's what St. John Damascus's famous Orthodox Faith book is, is a systematic theology. But what I want to stress here is that the reason that this is so important for us and why there will never ultimately be a just merging of Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy is because of this question of the essence energy distinction. So for us, it's crucial because not only do we see it as flowing naturally from the distinction between nature and person and God, which St. John of Damascus says is the root confusion of all heretics, all heretics confuse nature and person and God, and then thus by extension, they make the will of God the same as the divine essence, and they make person the same as the divine essence, right? And they make the actions of God the exact same as the divine essence. And this leads to a whole host of problems, uh, most notably of which is called the originist problematic. Origen thought that the term father was synonymous with the divine essence. This is exactly what Eunomius says. It's also what Aquinas says. Aquinas says that all the predicates of God are absolutely isomorphically synonymous and identified with the divine essence. Now, why is that a problem? Well, when we equate isomorphically and strictly everything that we say about God, with the divine essence. And when we remember that in this theology, in this philosophy, in this presupposition, the divine essence is absolutely simple. What happens is that all those distinctions about God become merely constructs. They're merely human categories that don't actually add up or, or match up to a real distinction in God. Because for Thomas, very explicitly many times in uh, Agenti, uh, against the Gentiles and his uh, against the Gentiles volume one and many times in volume one of the Summa and the different questions on divine simplicity he makes it very clear that those are just notional distinctions there's no real distinctions in an absolutely simple essence of God so what we're getting at here is that for us from the starting point we differ on what the nature of God is we believe that it's absolutely unknowable and that you can't predicate of the divine essence. Yes. And even Aquinas will say that at times. So we don't find a problem with that itself, with the idea of divine simplicity, right? We don't think that there's anything that you can say about God that will introduce parts or composition to God. There's no composition in God. But what happens in Aquinas, and you see this in De Veritate when he rejects St. John of Damascus's arguments for the essence energy distinction, what he says is that, well, we have to go to Aristotle and Maimonides because Aristotle and Maimonides make it very clear what absolute simplicity is. And if we were to ever say that distinctions were real, that would necessarily mean composition. Now, we as Orthodox simply reject that Hellenic presupposition. And it is a Hellenic presupposition. It's directly from Aristotle and Plato, the way that they talk about the one or the monad. For us, we don't see any contradiction, nor does it necessitate composition simply to say that there's distinctions in God that are real. And every Roman Catholic, if they thought about this, would admit this. They would admit that the Father is distinct from the Son. And if that's true, and if it's a real distinction, and we're not modalists, then saying distinctions in God are real does not equate to composition in God. It's that simple for us. So we just simply reject the foundational presuppositional maxim of what simplicity is that Aquinas works for. And he's very adamant about that. And Thomas out there that, that disagree with this actually just don't know what they're talking about. I mean, this is repeated in any standard Thomistic work. This is repeated in Garrigou Lagrange. This is repeated in Gilson. This is repeated in Ralph McHenry. They will all talk about simplicity in the same way. Read the Catholic Encyclopedia on divine simplicity. It's very clear that all of our distinctions are merely notional. They're not real. But again, this is why many people in Roman Catholicism have been tempted with perennialism and with the ideas of ecumenism. It leads directly to ecumenism because if you're consistent, if the distinctions that we say about God are not real, then all of the world religions are basically just talking roughly about the same being, which is just supreme being, right? Masonry. What does Aristotle call God? 
the great architect. What does Aldous Huxley say God is? A supreme absolute generic essence, a monad. What does Plato say? The one, the monad, the great architect. But for us, God is not the great architect. The God of Exodus 3.14 is not a great architect. He's I am that I am. He's, dis he's absolutely different, distinct from the way that the pagans and Plato and these different people describe God. So what we're going to see is that for orthodoxy, and this is something I've been arguing for a long time, and finally orthodox priests are even coming to realize this, especially as people convert, is that Irenaeus is a presuppositionalist, right? He uses a transcendental type of argumentation, as will St. Athanasius, as we'll see. So Father Schuping understood, understands and, and recognizes that actually Irenaeus's apologetic methodology, like St. Athanasius, is, is actually more transcendental and presuppositional. Now, why is that important? Well, because it shows that this kind of apologetic is more in line with correct theology. And even Van Til, the Protestant uh, 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 transcendental argument proponent, recognized that, I mean, he was wrong in his theology, but he was right when he realized that your apologetic methodology and the approach to apologetics can't be different or separate from your anthropology and your theology and your doctrine of revelation. They all kind of have to, because they're all related. Right? You can't address man's problem with a wrong anthropology. Right? This is what modernism, this is what Gnosticism, this is what evolutionary uh, materialism, Darwinism, this is what these uh, uh, false approaches try to do is to address man's problems with a faulty anthropology. Why do they have a faulty anthropology? Because they have a faulty everything, a faulty metaphysic, a faulty epistemology. It's a faulty worldview as a whole, and it fails on all three accounts, right? Right. If you listen to a lot of my philosophy talks, then you know that what makes up a worldview is the three basic groupings of philosophy, right? Uh, ethics, metaphysics, and epistemology. And aesthetics can be grouped under metaphysics or uh, ethics. So what we want to stress here is that for us, the apologetic encounter uh, is no different than, than the way that that Jesus would do apologetics, right? So in other words, there's a lot of, uh, or Paul, right? Paul in Acts 17 does a very great approach, uh, apologetically speaking, where he argues with the Greeks and he will at times cite Greek philosophers. Uh, but to illustrate a point, right? Paul doesn't go and say, Plato figured out all this truth about God. Now he does admit, yeah, there is some kind of vague notion of monotheism there. And I don't have a problem with that, right? So if Aristotle was sitting here and Aristotle said there's one God, I would say, yeah, I agree with you, Aristotle. There is one God. But when Aristotle starts to flesh that out and explain the God that he believes in, it's an incoherent, crazy God. It's a God who is thought, thinking itself that has no direct relationship to the world. And at the same time, Aristotle also says in other places that there are many gods. So Aristotle is both a polytheist and an at times a monotheist and so maybe he's a henotheist I don't know it's not really clear and that's because it's not revealed right Aristotle did not have access to revelation as we do and that's where scripture comes in right and we have special revelation which gives us a fuller perspective and informs uh, the many errors and clouded ideas that we might get from natural revelation but actually in orthodoxy strictly speaking we don't have natural revelation we reject the Thomistic doctrine of natural revelation because there is no generic God there's no such thing as a generic theism at all the only theism is the theism of the revealed God of Scripture right God didn't say in Exodus 3 I am super existent being I am super essence Right. The way that Joel Swan and other Thomists actually interpret that text is completely ridiculous. He says, I am that I am. He's a personal God. And so when Father Staniloy begins his great systematic theology of orthodoxy, he talks about this point and says, we don't believe in natural revelation. We don't believe in natural theology. There is no natural theology. Uh, does that mean that we can't look at nature and see that 
there's there, 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 there's a God. Yes. And in other words, men are guilty of not knowing the one true God, our God, the personal God, the Father. They're not guilty, as Romans 1 says, for knowing a generic theism or not knowing a generic theism. They're guilty for rejecting the one who was near them, even in their hearts, Paul says. How could Paul say in Acts 17 that the God that he's preaching is near to them, even in their hearts? Unless everything in creation testified to the Logos, and it does. So even though it's not immediately clear to an unbeliever that the triad God of Scripture, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is the true God, there's still some sense in which they deep down do have a mysterious conception or direct connection to the one true God. How could they not? He's everywhere. He fills all things. The word is near you, even in your hearts. He's talking to pagans. So we completely reject this Thomistic notion of natural theology. There is no natural theology. Now, other arguments also show natural theology to be preposterous. Not only does it link up with masonry and basically say that the apologetics of Mormons or the uh, Kalam cosmological argument are acceptable for Christianity. They're not. <laughs> None of those arguments are acceptable because there's no, again, like, so if I argue generic theism, right, and I got some guy to admit there's some kind of God out there, what, what if I just turn around and say that it's the devil? So generic theism is pointless. It's useless. And if you're talking to a smart atheist or a smart unbeliever, they could just turn around and say to you, well, if the God that you're arguing for to me is the generic theism God without content, right, just natural theology, that's my first step, then you really don't have a clear argument because in your own view, that God's existence isn't certain. And for Thomas, for Aquinas, that's correct. God's existence when you argue with the unbeliever, is not certain. The, un, the, the, the maxims, according to Aquinas, uh, of classical foundationalism, right, basic ideas of like the no, law of non-contradiction, those things are more certain than the existence of God. Stop and think about that, how preposterous that is. Man, man can have a greater certainty of 2 plus 2 equals 4 than God. Now, to an unbeliever, that might sound plausible. But to a person immersed in Scripture, that's a completely implausible and impossible. There are no generic categories and principles that are before or more certain than God. If you say that there are, then that thing takes preeminence and becomes a kind of God. Your mathematical or logical categories are at least logically prior to God. But there's nothing logically prior to God because all things ultimately relate to the Logos, right? And this is why St. Maximus Confessor goes to such great length talking about the Logoi. Now, all of that to set the stage for why what I'm going to be arguing is com or what I've been arguing is actually completely consistent with the approach uh, of St. Athanasius in Against the Heathen. So let's look at the different world systems and world religions out there and let's discover that just like Thomism is wrong to think that there's a generic theism out there, that we can all just agree on a generic theism, we can't because number one, many of those generic theists believe that that God is impersonal. And that's essentially where St. Athanasius will pick up his apologetic treatise. He's going to say, look, the ideas of fate and chaos and, 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 and nonsensical forces out there ruling, once you allow that into your, your belief system, then ultimately chaos and fate are the overriding absolute principle in your system. You might want to interject the God over here and Zeus over there and this God over there, and but they're all still ultimately kind of underneath fate. We're also going to see that really there's no moral system in this that's consistent. There's not a coherent moral system when the gods do all kinds of crazy stuff, right? So how are we ever going to have an idea of basic right and wrong? 
And that's kind of what people are looking for when they, you know, look at different religious traditions. And so it is the, is the, where do you derive from Wo, Wotan or Odin the rights and the wrongs? Does he require animal sacrifice? Does he require murdering? A, a kind of vengeance, vengeance killing upon anyone who wrongs you? Do you take a hammer and crack the head of anyone who dishonors you? I think, isn't that in some of the Kalevala and the different Icelandic sagas? Like, they, <laughs> the guys just, like, take hammers to people's heads. Uh, blood's going everywhere. Uh, I mean, is that, is that virtuous or not? Is, that, is it not? Uh, is there, there's, so, in other words, they're, rel they're relativistic. It's the paganism of whatever any guy wants. Now, the pagans are going to say, well... Yeah, but we don't like your universalism. Your universal claims, that's directly out of your monotheism. And that's the problem. And we really, er, we're some, that's the real problem. The great conspiracy of all time is monotheism. Well, let's see if that actually holds up. And we're going to look at St. Athanasius's philosophical and theological arguments to that effect. Now, this is the introductory 20 minutes. Uh, in the full talk, we're going to get into uh, chapter by chapter. Not long. Again, this is, you know, little paragraph chapters, uh, you know, 20, 30 page work uh, of this famous essay. And we're going to see that this apologetic work is completely in line with the apologetic work that you've been hearing me do for many years now. It's not Thomistic, nor was St. Uh, Saint Irenaeus' apologetic Thomistic. It was biblical. It was based on revelation and it was presuppositional. Uh, and we're going to see that. And the greatest proof for this, I think, ultimately, especially in contrast to something like Thomism, and as as you will soon see, uh, I will be debating uh, Nick Fuentes. Uh, finally, we have a Roman Catholic who's agreed. I thank you, Nick, from America First Media has agreed to come on, and we're going to do a formal debate about uh, Orthodox theology versus Roman Catholicism. So hopefully we can get into some of these topics. I don't actually, I don't know to what degree uh, Nick is is familiar with Thomism. I hear that he's a an avid defender of uh, Roman Catholicism. So that'll be interesting to see. Um, I've watched some of his political stuff. I don't don't really know where he's at theologically, but it's going to be fun. It'll be civil. It'll be a, a you know a question response uh, like we did in the debate with Kokesh. So look for that soon, and if you would like to hear the full talk, the full uh, philosophical analysis, uh, subscribe at Jason Ellis for four ninety five a month or for sixty dollars a year, uh, and we will go through Saint Athanasius's famous apologetic against the heathen. Thank you. Oh, also get my book Esoteric Hollywood: Sex Cults and Symbols in Film. Look for the sequel coming soon. Sign copies at Jason Analysis at the tab, and also right here, subscribe to my channel. Help me to grow.